Welcome back to EV News Daily. Coming up today, VW's EV comeback plan in China revealed secrets to the new Porsche Taycan efficiency and tech under the skin. And Google is focusing on EV charging. And if you stay tuned, later in the show, I'll tell you what the result was of that Neo range test they did this week with their new 150 kilowatt hour battery. Well, good morning, good afternoon or good evening. Wherever you are in the world, welcome to EV News Daily, your trusted source of EV information. For Thursday, 18th of April, I'm Martin Lee, and I go through every EV story so you don't have to. We're live at 5pm UK, midday Eastern. Patreon supporters get the episodes as soon as they're ready and ad-free. Be like them by clicking on a link in the show notes. We'll start with news of Volkswagen's comeback plan in China, having recently lost their number one status to rival BYD. Recently on the podcast, I told you, well, last year about their big investment and their partnership with Xpeng. So we can now see some of the fruits of that partnership. And Volkswagen are creating a new VEV architecture dubbed the CEA, China Electrical Architecture, aimed at making EVs more affordable, at least to begin with in China. But this tech could be seen elsewhere if if it's successful, the CEA is set to be employed in VW branded EVs developed in China starting in 2026. This new platform is expected to cut development costs by 40% compared to VW's German developed platforms like the MEB platform, which their ID cars sit upon, primarily by reducing the number of control units. The CEA design features a central computer and a zonal structure that simplifies the vehicle's electronic systems, potentially reducing the electronic control units by up to 30%. Well, VW plans to introduce four entry-level compact EVs using this new platform in 2026, along with two mid-range models, including an SUV. That's the one jointly developed with Xpeng to begin with. Volkswagen is emphasizing the importance of the Chinese market to them. Uh, they're going to showcase 44 models at the forthcoming Beijing Auto Show, nearly half of which are going to be electric vehicles, including six global premieres. Now, last year, VW invested $700 million for a 5% stake in Xpeng with an agreement to launch two VW-branded EV models by 2026. Well, as part of its efforts to reclaim market share in China, VW is investing 2.5 billion euros, that's about 2.66 billion US dollars, to enhance their production and innovation capabilities. Uh, the company's ID3 model has been one of the more recent China success stories, and that followed a price reduction of over $5,100. So the news that broke last year, their investment in Xpeng, that created lots of headlines of VW saying, maybe we don't know it all ourselves. Maybe the Chinese market is something that we need to focus on with some local knowledge as well. And this new platform, which will bring entry-level EVs by reducing the complexity of the platform, and, and you would think deliver the things that are important to a more localized Chinese buyer that is a more tech-focused experience, a more connected experience typically than markets outside of China, will be coming in a couple of years' time. Is that going to be too late, if I can use that word. Maybe late isn't the right word, but uh, will they have missed the boat slightly? Should that be, have been a 2024 release if they were able to compete with those domestic names? Or has VW still got enough brand name, the heritage, love in the country uh, to regain their dominance against the likes of all those big Chinese names that we talk about day in, day out on this podcast? And if it is a success, maybe this could be something that they bring to our market, to Western markets, to bring those more affordable, cheaper EVs to market come the later part of this decade. Next up, and a new press release from Lucid points out some of the improvements they've made to the Lucid Air Grand Touring, now including a heat bump. Uh, enhancing cold weather efficiency and reducing range loss. The second model in the air lineup to receive this feature following the high-performance Sapphire, the $250,000, a very impressive high-performance vehicle. This, though, the Air Grand Touring, uh, adds the heat pump to boost energy efficiency during longer trips in colder climates, addressing the common issue of reduced battery range in low temperatures. Lucid says they've improved the vehicle's DC charging from between 15 to 30%, making it faster 
booster, aided by some enhanced automatic battery preconditioning, preparing the battery optimally en route for you to charge. Technical improvements in the vehicle's motors, the battery cell chemistry, and thermal characteristics have also been made to reduce any waste heat. This allows the Grand Touring to maintain optimal performance during any extended periods, they say, of dynamic driving. Well, the Grand Touring maintains its EPA estimated range of 516 miles, that is 830 kilometers. It remains priced at $111,000, which includes the $1,500 destination charge. This model stands above its siblings in terms of range at 516 miles. There is the Air Pure, which does 419 miles, and the Air Touring at 411 miles. Now let's talk Porsche Taycan and an article on Inside EVs based on interviews with the Porsche engineers I think is highly revealing about how they've made all of these improvements to the new Porsche Taycan, how it goes so much further and what's really under the skin. The first thing that they talk about is how the engineers say they've moved to a new chemistry for the batteries, previously NMC712, that is nickel manganese cobalt uh, 712 refers to the parts out of 10 uh, for those different elements it's now an 811 battery chemistry which is more energy dense enhancing nickel components for improved performance as well and the high voltage battery engineer on the Tycon project Klaus Wippler says that both the new electric McCann and the Tycon are using these new NMC 811 cells but actually between the Tycon and the McCann they have some different chemical makeups, which I thought was interesting. Also interesting was the battery packs getting bigger, which we knew anyway. So the standard battery pack has gone from 71 to 82 kilowatt hours, and the Performance Plus, the big battery, has gone from 83.7 to 97 kilowatt hours usable, the gross being well over 100 kilowatt hours on that. So these in battery, in battery enhancements with a greater energy density to the cells, but also uh, the heavier battery packs, I um, mean, they've got to look at weight saving, which they have done. Now, the battery enhancements have led to a 14% increase in range alone, just on the battery enhancements, according to Sarah Razvani, the project lead for the Tycon battery. But what about that added weight? Well, Porsche has made several weight-reducing adjustments, lighter copper bus bars, fewer fuses, and replacing the steel under tray to a composite one. The weight of the Performance Plus battery, even though it's so much bigger now, has actually decreased. It's gone from 634 kilograms, about 1,400 pounds, uh, to 625 kilograms. A slight reduction, but still, it's very impressive to have so much more range and more energy capacity. That's gone up by 12%, and the weight of the battery itself has gone down. They've made improvements to thermal management systems and expanded the optimal temperature range for battery operation, enhancing the fast charging capability, which will go down to as low as 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit and still be able to charge optimally. That is significantly lower than previously. The Taycan now features an upgraded heat pump and an 800 volt HVAC compressor doubling the voltage of the previous 400 volt systems. They say that speeds up battery heating and cooling. There's new wheel designs for the summer range tires on the 20 inches. They've enhanced the rear motor, enhanced the rear inverter to boost efficiency over previous versions. The gauge cluster, now if you are a driver of the Taycan, will display the battery temperature, which we had, uh, and also It'll now display the maximum charging rate, the theoretical maximum charging rate, based on a dynamic calculation, various factors like temperature and state of charge. A new standard feature, the charging planner, navigates to suitable charging stations and preheats the battery for optimal charging, as you'd expect, with the new Tycom supporting 320 kilowatts charging compared to 270 before. It'll go from 8 to 80%, and normally we ask the car makers to always tell us the 10 to 80% number, but they say 8 to 80 in 16 minutes if you have the larger battery. They've worked on regen as well, the braking capacity. Uh, it will regen at 400 kilowatts. Wow. I mean, that was pretty high before. It was 320 before, but 400 kilowatts of regen power um, and enough to handle 0.5G of deceleration with regen alone. Now, Porsche... Add all that together and anticipate a 35% increase in range for both the base and high-end uh, models as well for the Taycan. So I think a great piece of writing, great piece of research. I really enjoyed that Inside EVs piece, and there's loads more that you'll discover if you want to go have a read of that. While staying with the Porsche Taycan, 
kind of. Uh, that was one of the cars noted by Kelly Blue Book in a piece of data they put out today about how well the Tesla Cybertruck is doing. Tesla, they claim, sold 2,803 Cybertrucks in the United States during the first quarter of this year, according to Kelly Blue Book data. These sales figures place the Cybertruck just ahead of the aforementioned Porsche Taycan, which they say sold 1,925 units. That is a 26% increase on its US sales year on year. Now, the Cybertruck lagged behind electric pickup trucks like the Ford F-150 Lightning and the Rivian R1T. The Ford F-150 Lightning leading the way uh, with 7,743 US sales in the first quarter of the year. Cybertruck starting at 80 grand, but really, you know, 100 grand. And also the Taycan base price starts around 100 grand. Odd to compare those two vehicles and to claim that the Cybertruck had a win against the Porsche Taycan when one's a truck and one's a sports car. But either way, I know what they were trying to do with that data and trying to illustrate certain things. So we're grateful for that to, to, to come out because next week on the earnings call with Tesla, we don't think that they'll be giving us any specific Cybertruck numbers. They'll be wrapping that into something else, much like they wrap the three and the Y uh, together. I'll be stunned if they do give us a, a Solus Cybertruck number purely for the US. Almost certainly they won't do that. But either way, these things are interesting to look at. Thank you to Kelly Blue Book for doing that research. The Cybertruck sales uh, modest when compared to the vehicles that really make a difference at Tesla. And in fact, I say vehicles, the vehicle, the Model Y, which makes all the difference. We'll find out more next week on Tesla's earning call. Now, as promised, a follow-up on the Neo ET7's range run. The Neo ET7 model is now equipped with a 150 kilowatt hour semi-solid-state battery in China. And earlier this week, I told you they were going to do some range runs with this, and I'd give you the result when we got it. And, well, we've got it. Uh, the Neo ET7 very much a kind of Model S competitor in terms of its dimensions and shape. They recorded 1,070 kilometers on a single run. That is 665 miles, which is incredible. For a single run, 665 miles of real-world range. This is not CLTC. This is not uh, any of the wildly optimistic official range numbers. This was three different vehicles doing three different real-world routes, and this was the one that went the furthest. Not by much, actually, uh, must point out. The performance was part of a real-world range challenge for the new ET7 sedan. It was conducted two days ago on April 16th, and the first of the 150 kilowatt hour semi solid state battery packs was produced earlier this month as well from their factory. The test included three of these vehicles and all doing three different routes. The specific one that achieved this mileage, the 1,070 kilometers or 665 miles, uh, was tested with a consumed energy rating at the end of it of 12.7 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. I prefer to do the conversion to do 4.4 miles per kilowatt hour. So that is not... It's, it's a very large battery. In what is a large vehicle, yes, there are larger batteries out there in larger vehicles, like what we talked about yesterday with the Sierra EV, the Denali Edition, uh, same as the Hummer, same as the Silverado, with 200-plus kilowatt hours. You can make vehicles go further by adding more battery to them. Let's look at the efficiency as the storyline of maybe the second half of this decade. Let's work out how car makers can become more efficient. This is an efficient vehicle, by the way. I'm not doing it down. 4.4 miles per kilowatt hour, uh, 127 watt hours per kilometer. So uh, this is uh, the driving duration. I'm trying to recall the stats here. 12.8 hours they drove for uh, an average speed of about 50 miles an hour, so quite a slow run. Uh, this wasn't a 70 mile an hour range test. Maximum speed they hit was 73 miles an hour or 118 kilometers. So overall, I think this is interesting. They were carrying approximately 200 kilograms of load. That would imply perhaps two to three people uh, and an altitude change of about 1,800 meters. So yeah, I'm just trying to think about my conclusions uh, on this. It, it's good without having to scrape me off the floor good. 4.4 miles per kilowatt hour is around about where good efficiency lies. If you're driving a Tesla, our old Kona would regularly read in the fives if it was in the summer and we were doing an average speed of, say, 50 miles an hour, depending on the road and, you know, certainly in the mid fours. And so 
I think what's interesting about this is it's real world, uh, which is, we love these numbers, and also uh, the fact that this new battery technology uh, seems to be delivering on on good, very good uh, results. But let me know what you think. I, I feel like I'm downplaying it almost, and, and now I'm being an apologist for myself. Now, this is a good result, and well done to Neo. Now, earlier this week, I told you about the Alfa Romeo story where they were going to call their new EV the Milano, but now they have to call it the Junior. Another name from their their history. But that was because uh, politicians got involved and said they couldn't use the Milano name. Now, there's a bit of afters to this story. At the time, the press release from Solantis was, I think, good natured. And they said, no problem, tons of names we could pick. And here's the new Junior. And we look forward to making this vehicle, uh, which will be... Uh, mass-produced Alfa Romeo EV, which is the point, which is very exciting, actually, isn't it? Now, Jean-Philippe Imparato, who is the head of Alfa Romeo, has been talking to Autocar magazine, and like I say, a little bit of afters on this story, because he has called on Italian politicians to, well, maybe get their priorities sorted and to prioritise safeguarding the automotive industry in Italy and safeguarding real-world jobs rather than focusing on what car companies call their cars. This follows the recent controversy where the Milano had to be renamed the Junior because Italy's industry minister, Adolfo Urso, saying that the name breached Italian laws, the law restricting geographic names to products that are manufactured where the name references. So, Parmigiano cheese. You can't call it that. Uh, well, the dispute arose after the Stellantis CEO, Carlos Tavares, warned the Italian government against providing incentives to foreign firms. So while the Italian government talking about, well, maybe we just give some incentives to the Chinese firms to come in and build their batteries here, maybe focus on other things like protecting local jobs. The Milano, sorry, the Junior, will be made at the Stellantis facility in Poland on the same platform as vehicles like the Jeep Avenger and the Fiat 600e. But of course, it will have all of that Italian flair and styling. And for my YouTube viewers, rather than listeners to the audio version of the podcast, I'll pop a picture online. It looks very cool. It's got the same specs as all the other cars on that platform. So it'll have a 54 kilowatt hour battery and charge at about 100 kilowatts DC fast charging. Despite the renaming, which has, I would say, uh, been a bit of a win for the car company. Uh, everyone has probably noticed it because of that. Lots of public attention. Uh, the car's production in Poland was never in doubt. It was always going to be in Poland. That's been public knowledge for a long time now. Alfa Romeo's financial turnaround, also under Stellantis, has been notable. Uh, before Stellantis came around in January 2021, Alfa Romeo was losing hundreds of millions of euros, and it's a now profitable company. So perhaps the Italians should be proud of having a profitable car company under the Stellantis umbrella, rather than worrying about what the cars are actually called. But there we go. Uh, the upcoming next generation Stelvio SUV and Giulia Saloon will be made in Italy uh, starting in 2025. Well, if you fancy saving some money for my US viewers and listeners, an auto blog report points out that through this month in April, yes, I know we're halfway through the month already, uh, BMW is offering rebates of up to $7,500 on select electric vehicles. The BMW i4 and i5 have a $5,000 rebate. Higher-end models like the i7 and the iX get that higher $7,500 uh, rebate adding loyalty discounts as well uh, will take up to three thousand dollars off uh, rebates are applicable across uh, the different methods of purchasing a bmw electric vehicle whether that is cash or bmw financial services or external lending leasing deals probably offer the most savings uh, with up to seven thousand five hundred dollars off the i4 and the i5 as well. A reminder, the federal tax credit uh, does not apply to these vehicles. But for some of the more expensive vehicles, uh, leasing an i7, leasing an ix can get you up to $13,000 off those vehicles. And it's not like this is some sort of fire sale, desperate thing to juice the books either. BMW have been on a bit of a rip lately. Uh, they should be I think, pleased with their sales numbers, certainly with the uh, the vehicles they have on the road at the moment, going down very well with reviewers and customers alike, making them more attractive now with these offers, but actually doing okay in terms of their competition as well. 
Now, a story that I was interested to see come across the desk earlier today, because as a Polestar driver, I, I was always interested before we got the car how I would go as, as someone who is, I'm fully immersed in Apple world. It's the watch, it's the phone, it's multiple iPads. And only last year, maybe earlier this year, actually, I finally moved across my productivity to an Apple laptop. So this podcast is filmed the audio is done edited all on it was a, a you i didn't want to go uh, like a new macbook just in case i needed to sort of resell it i didn't get on with it um and not lose too much money on that decision so i went with a used macbook pro m1 max which just sits down here out of view and um uh, it's been fine. A bit of a bit of relearning for my 45-year-old brain. But apart from that, some muscle memory. I'm now fully in the Apple world. So buying the Polestar, we thought, well, what's it going to be like? Because it runs on Google. And will it just be a bit of a pain? And honestly, it's not. I mean, obviously, it's got CarPlay. But I never, ever plug the phone in. I mean, I got a Gmail address anyway. So that logs into the car. And it's, it's a very seamless process. Now, Google is integrating real-time charger availability and charging speed data into these built-in vehicle maps uh, to ADV drivers in locating nearby charging stations and make a choice between which one they would like. Well, these updated maps will proactively suggest where you might want to charge, uh, taking into account the battery level of your vehicle, because, of course, it has access to the BMS. It's completely integrated into the very deepest layers of the vehicle. Uh, vehicles from eight car makers, from Volvo, Polestar to Honda, that have have Google's built-in technology. More brands like Ford will be adopting this soon as well. Uh, we'll get this to assist in locating more elusive charging stations like those in multi-level parking garages or just, you know, we've all done it. We've all gone to charge and we, where's the charger? Which, which corner of the car park is it in? Google Maps say that they are introducing AI-powered summaries to crowdsource all of the different reviews of those chargers derived from extensive user input to work out exactly where they are to give you a more straightforward location so you can go and find the charges. Google Travel is also launching a new feature to allow travelers to filter hotels that provide EV charging facilities based on uh, what charges they have, which will make your travel planning easier for EV owners. So you can just filter out those hotels that have got the right kind of charging that you want to use, and you can book those hotels. Pop some um, screenshots online for you know, for my viewers who haven't seen this before, uh, again, this is uh, an example of what it looks like, certainly inside what, what I'm used to seeing inside the Polestar, which is a very Tesla-like experience, to be honest with you. Um, the only thing that I would say, and from just two months of ownership, two, three months of ownership now, of the Polestar 2, um, is that it can be a little bit pessimistic when you first add a destination or a charger to the nav and even if i've been driving for a period of time that my driving style isn't changing the weather isn't changing uh, the in, in what i'm trying to say is the efficiency of the vehicle isn't changing i'm not suddenly halving my speed and etc that even then if it says i'll get to a charger with five percent remaining over the course of the journey i'll often see that creep up to six seven eight nine i'll often arrive there with a higher state of charge than it says but i guess that's better right, than it providing a more optimistic prediction scenario and then leaving you in the lurch, I guess. These enhancements are part of Google's broad strategy to reduce uh, any kind of concern amongst EV users of using their software by improving the tools and efficient navigation to charging stations. Let's talk about one of the Geely brands, LEVC, and that might not mean a huge amount to you. Certainly will for my UK listeners and for any listeners that go in and around London, because you see plenty of the London black cabs these days, which are range extender black cabs, the LEVC a taxi company providing uh, that uh, for a long time now. Those black cabs to uh, London taxi drivers, and they're so much better. Really well designed inside as a customer, but of course they are battery powered but with a range extender i think it's the perfect solution in the interim actually before they go pure ev well levc is the company behind it recently they unveiled a new mpv uh, people mover multi-purpose vehicle and it's called the l380 and today they've uh, started to show off what the interior might look like now for my youtube viewers i'll give you a quick look at the outside um this is a big step in their move from taxi production to a broader focus on mobility very similar to what we've seen recently with some of the chinese uh, people movers uh, which is uh, a very straight uh, back of the vehicle a vertical 
uh, kind of cut off, really, done for aero reasons and done for maximizing the space inside as well. But they say the interior is designed to emulate the luxury of airline first class cabins. So let's take a look then. Yeah, I think they've pretty much nailed that. Picture on screen right now I'll show you is of a, um, a six-seat uh, variant, and this is basically six first-class you know, aircraft seats. So lots of leg room and lots of ability to recline these seats. I don't know how far you, you go back to a sort of flatbed style. I'm not sure that it's big enough for that, but certainly it does look like it could accommodate six people in a lot of comfort, eight people in comfort as well, uh, you would say. Passengers enjoying... Seats, they say, made from uh, a premium fabrics, and these also fold to create what they describe as sleeping spaces. They've gone premium with the interior uh, fabrics used, high-end Alcantara, fa uh, Alcantara fabrics, and some bright chrome and crystal accents, they say, providing a more lavish environment. Lots of screens, lots of floating iPad-style screens on the back of the seat uh, in front of you, and certainly in the front as well, a very nice place to be by the look of it. So where can you get this vehicle? Well, initially it will be launched, made and launched for the Chinese market, but there are plans to introduce this vehicle to at least the UK market within the next two years. And if you need to move people about in style, and honestly, look, this, this looks like a great place to be just for the driver, but if you're doing hotel runs, airport runs, look, if you've got a big family and you particularly like your children, like, I love my children, I don't always like them that much, but you know, I'm not sure I'd put them in this, because our kids just smush stuff into seats, don't they? But hey, if you particularly want to take the risk, this would be great for larger families as well. Coming to the UK, they say within a couple of years. Obviously, we can't say until these vehicles arrive and are on sale. But another example of a uh, innovative thinking around how to maximise the space inside an electric version of a people carrier. Well, one for my UK listeners next. And according to a new piece of analysis by Geotab in their taking charge report, the United Kingdom is the most conducive market in Europe for the adoption of electric vehicles for fleet operators. The study looked at 1.3 million vehicles in seven European countries, and they found that 66% of combustion engine fleet vehicles in the UK could easily be replaced with electric models today without affecting any of the day-to-day -day operational needs. The transition could result in big cost savings for UK businesses, decreasing total cost of ownership over a seven-year period. For instance, a UK company could save about £13,000 per vehicle if you switch to electric. That's a big saving to make over those seven years. If you have a large fleet, of course, you can start to save in the hundreds of thousands of pounds as well. Uh, despite offering weaker national EV incentives than other countries like France, Germany, Italy and Spain, which all provide upfront purchase incentives of various shapes and sizes, the UK still lacks many of those EV incentives. The government phased out the plug-in car grant back in 2022. I think that finally disappeared. I did benefit from that a couple of times with the early Zoes that we bought back in the day. Uh, data from the Report highlighting that the average daily mileage for a business vehicle is drum roll. What do you think? In the UK, it's 52 miles. The average daily mileage for a business vehicle in the UK, 84 kilometers or 52 miles. That is well within the range of any EV. It's well within the range of plug in hybrids these days. Uh, now, Aaron Jarvis from Geotab noting the nearly half of the vehicles they monitored never exceeded 250 miles or 400 kilometers in any single day of the entire study, emphasizing the practicality and no need to worry about moving to EV. By the way, if you're enjoying the podcast today, if you haven't already subscribed to the audio feed, and if you're a podcast listener, you'll know how to do this. It's so easy. You just get your podcast app, whatever app or uh, thing you prefer to use, and just type in EV News Daily and hit subscribe. It's obviously free, and that means that whether you're on the road, whether you're on the go, and you're listening to your favorite podcast in your ears, or whether you're watching the YouTube version of this, uh, you get it in both places. And if you don't listen to it day in, day out, you can just delete the, the odd shows that download if you catch the video version, but it means that you'll never be without your daily dose of electric vehicle news. I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the audio version of this podcast as well, so you've always got it on tap. Now let's talk about Ionity, the European charging network, and another big name that Tesla have lost in recent days. Maybe not as senior, of course, as names like Drew Baglino, that uh, was almost at the very top of Tesla, who recently resigned over the weekend amongst the, the big layoffs that were happening. Uh, but this is a, certainly a loss to 
Tesla, uh, Jerome Van Tilburg, will take over as the CEO of Ionity, the fast charging network, as of next month. Previously, he was the head of charging at Tesla for the EMEA region and a big contribution made with the expansion of the Tesla supercharging network as it opened up as well to third-party vehicles. Uh, his background includes extensive experience in developing and expanding charging networks across Europe. Uh, the head of charging and energy at Ford Model E, Jörg Hofmeister, was talking on behalf of Ionity, of course, Ford, one of the shareholders of that enterprise, uh, saying that his comprehensive track record at Tesla and expertise at Tesla will benefit Ionity. So that's one of the charging networks over here that has some very fast charges uh, available, over 600 charging parks spreading 24 European countries and 3,600 charging points as well. And a couple of Tesla stories to finish off today's podcast. Construction of Tesla's new Megapack factory for battery energy storage systems. That's going to be in Shanghai, and the construction should start in May, according to this report on CNEV Post. Plans to start mass production of the Megapacks will be in the first quarter of 2025, according to local media reports. Uh, Tesla has witnessed significant growth in the energy storage sector, uh, with installed capacity increasing 125 in 2023. Well, last year, Tesla did a deal with authorities in Shanghai uh, to establish their mega factory production, focusing on the mega pack energy storage systems. Uh, the facility will mark Tesla's first venture into actually building energy storage outside of the United States. They want to make 10,000 of the mega packs every year. That's about 40 gigawatt hours of energy storage capacity added to Tesla's storage business. Each mega pack is about three about three megawatt hours of, of energy storage. That's maybe three and a half thousand homes powered for an hour when it's attached to the grid. And the first time that'll be made outside of the US with more investment in China for Tesla. And finally, Tesla is seeking shareholder approval to reinstate the $56 billion compensation package for the CEO, Elon Musk, previously uh, disallowed by the Delaware judge. The proposal will be voted on during Tesla's AGM on June 13th. Alongside Musk's compensation, Tesla plans to relocate its corporate headquarters to Texas from its current location. Well, this move comes as Tesla faces various challenges, including declining sales, decreased demand for some of their models, uh, some would say an aging vehicle lineup, whether you count or don't count, things like the Highland edition of the Model 3, and a significant drop in their stock price, 37% this year and 60% from peaks. Uh, should the shareholders approve the new compensation package, Tesla indicating the necessity to potentially uh, negotiate an alternative arrangements if shareholders don't agree to this, which you would think they probably would do, but I don't know the intricacies of how the uh, the vote might turn out. Uh, but if they do need to renegotiate that with their CEO, it'll be time-consuming and costly because of the complexities in the Delaware lawsuit. This compensation plan goes back to 2018, doesn't it? Uh, and it's up for ratification once again. Now, Mr. Musk does not take a salary or cash bonuses. Instead, it offers stock options upon achieving certain performance metrics like market value and financial targets. Despite the potential move to Texas, legal challenges could well persist because if this does get approved, uh, the company would still be a Delaware corporation at the time of the vote. That would allow for, once again, legal proceedings in the Delaware courts should it be challenged again. Well, the Securities and Exchange Commission's proxy statement doesn't cover Musk's request to own 25% of Tesla. He argues it's necessary for pursuing artificial intelligence within Tesla, and that he, if he doesn't get more than the current 20.5% of Tesla that he owns, he will pursue AI projects outside of the company. Mr. Musk has indicated a preference to work within Tesla, but he wants that increased stake. And that is your podcast today. Let's get to 10,000 subscribers together. I'd love to do that by the summer. So if you're watching this and you're not yet a subscriber, please do hit that. It's free to do, and it helps other people to discover the podcast as well. As we spread the word far and wide about electric vehicles every single day, and have been doing for 
well over 2,000 episodes in the audio archive and now uh, back on YouTube and uh, X and various places visually as well. We'd very much appreciate your help to build the show and maybe sharing this podcast with somebody, maybe friends or family members who might be interested in learning about the world of EVs and maybe they work in the industry as well and would appreciate a 20-30 minute update every morning so they are completely on top of what's happening. And of course, if you want to be part of the Patreon Legends list, well, that would be great. The podcast will always be free, but if you want to join in with the Patreon gang, uh, check that out. Our premium partners are Porsche of the Village in Cincinnati, Audi of Cincinnati East, Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East, National Car Charging on the US mainland, and Aloha Charge in Hawaii. Derek Riley from Nevo.ie and the Nevo EV Review Island YouTube channel. Octopus Electroverse Global Public Charging Made Simple with one app and one map and least plan electric moments, providing all the tools and guidance EV drivers need. Have a good and see tomorrow. And remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.